So let's also meet people where they are in their humanity. Let's remind ourselves, is this the most humane way we can treat what's going on at this time if we're lashing out, if we're um, violently attacking one another, if we're shaming or humiliating people on, on public platforms, right? Like, so doing that is also bringing compassionate care to social justice. And so there's a mindful way to be an activist. And that's where I come in. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Seek the Joy podcast. Happy Seek the Joy Tuesday. I'm your host, Sydney Weiss, and on the podcast this week is Asha Terry. She's an author, award-winning community mental health advocate, psychotherapist, and certified life coach. And as a mindfulness practitioner, Asha has coached and consulted individuals and groups of people really throughout the world on personal development, lifestyle, and wellness. And I was so excited to sit down to have this conversation with Asha, but I'm even more excited to share it with you because it's really a beautiful conversation and a powerful conversation about bringing compassionate care, empathy, and joy to activism, to social justice, while also honoring ourselves and honoring our own self-care. So in this week's new episode, we chat all about Asha's journey, becoming a mental health advocate and licensed therapist, being of service while also experiencing what you're helping others transform, and anxiety and other difficult emotions as an experience and not a characteristic. Asha shares how we can continue to process tough things, do the important work, and practice self-care all while empowering ourselves in our own activism. Plus, we, we really have an incredible conversation about not denying our experiences with trauma, the importance of empathy as a practice, creating emotional safety for people who have never felt safe, Joy existing at the same time as pain, Asha's biggest dream, and so much more. This is really such a beautiful and powerful conversation, and I cannot wait to hear what you guys think. Make sure to join the conversation on our social media channels. We are at Seek the Joy Podcast everywhere. And don't forget to hit subscribe on Apple Podcasts, follow along on Spotify, and leave us a rating and review. Ratings and reviews not only help the show get seen by new people, but also shares with people what Seek the Joy Podcast is all about. When you do leave us that rating and review, take a screenshot of your review and and send it to sydney at seekthejoypodcast.com. I'll send you our guide for infusing more joy into your life as a thank you. And it's just a great way for us to connect outside of the show too. Okay, one last thing before we dive in. About 10 or 15 minutes into this conversation, we totally had some technical difficulties and the audio is funny and the sound is weird. But if you just turn the volume up a little bit on your end when you get to that part, you should hear us, no problem. But I'm telling you, you never know what's going to happen when you're when you're podcasting. But it doesn't take away from this really beautiful, powerful, and vulnerable conversation. I'm so grateful for everything that Asha shared. And I know you're going to take so much from Asha's wisdom and experience and her tips. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Asha Terry. So much of what you do is focused on mindfulness and within this space. So I'd love to start off and talk about how you got here. Where did your own journey um, to this work really begin? Thank you for the question. And foremost, thank you for having me on your show. Yeah. It's a delight to be here. Um, my journey, I'll make it as short as I can. It started with me believing at four years old, I was going to grow up and become a nurse. Hmm. And I don't exactly know where I got that ideation from, but I stayed on that path, was accepted to Pace University nursing program in Westchester, New York. And I actually did two years of nursing. And similar to your story, and there's two parts to this, I didn't pass my first major exam to allow me to um, go on to the next level in my nursing program. And I was very frustrated, very sad, and very tired, honestly, because mm -hmm. I put a lot of work, study hours by myself and with groups to 
excel. And I was used to excelling in high school and I found that I was overstudying and not excelling. And mm-hmm. so I was actually quite sad about that. And at the same time, unsure of what to do next, because I had spent 14 years of my life identifying myself as a soon to be nurse or one day I will be a nurse. So when this time arrived, I um, spoke to a really good friend who was in a program at, at Pace at the time, uh, nurse, it wasn't nursing, but it was human services. And she said, take a couple of classes or take a class. And so I jumped in both feet first and took two classes, did quite well, loved it. All of my courses matriculated into human services. I changed my major and still within my four year undergraduate program, I graduated on time um, with a bachelor's in human services and then went to graduate school right after at Fordham University in Manhattan for uh, social work. I continued to go on. Um, I thought I was done. And then several (laughs) years later, I went back to school one more time um, in my industry and I got a a psychoanalytic certificate in psychoanalysis. And then that for me um, helped to identify what I wanted to do, which was to go into private practice, which is what I own now. And later, maybe mid 2000s, late 2000s, I went back and got a certificate in life coaching to complement the work I'm doing in psychotherapy. And um, it helped because a lot of people were getting into that industry, but also I had the background in social work and was doing therapy. So they were very similar. And like you, when I um, didn't pass my licensure exam the first time with my master's, I was a little frustrated, but Mm -hmm. I buckled down and I refocused and remembered why I decided to do this to begin with. And once I did that, I passed my exam, became licensed as a social worker, did a lot of different community-based work for a while, went into corporate work, and then later I founded my now behavioral health consulting services, which provides counseling, coaching, and consulting. I love what you just shared about your journey because yes, I can totally like resonate with what you shared in your experience. And I found that so many of us walk a very similar path in terms of, we have this idea of who we want to be, what that's going to look like, the timeline that we're going to do it in, and then Mm -hmm. it doesn't happen. And we're so used to excelling in a certain way, or we define success or excelling, we define it a certain way. And then Mm -hmm. when that sort of comes crashing down on us, we're like, wait, who are we actually? What is our value actually? What is success to us actually? It's a a hard realization in the moment, but also very life-changing. It is. It very much is. And I love how for you, you found a way to sort of pick yourself up and find a new path, but it was also very similar um, in a lot of ways to what you set out to do to begin Mm -hmm. with. Yeah. I wanted to stay in the helping industry because at the core of who I am, I am a helper. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know anything else and I didn't feel compelled to do anything else. And that for me with my coaching work has been one of the most important aspects of working with individuals who want to start a business or who want to pivot in their careers or come out of an unhealthy relationship. And that's what I focus on in my coaching work. And it's always about what's the compelling reason what's driving your motivation, what are you willing to do no matter what, which is one of my catchphrases, to Mm -hmm. achieve the life of your dreams. And for a lot of people, we don't sometimes know. And at other times, it changes. And for me, I was right in the crux of that. I was thinking, oh my gosh, I'm I'm only supposed to be a nurse. This is what I've dreamt (laughs) of my entire life. And I talk about it in my new book. But when that didn't happen, when I really sat with how I felt, Sydney, it was really overwhelming. I didn't know how exhausted I was for those two years I was in my nursing program. I put on 20 pounds. I didn't sleep a lot. I didn't see my friends very often. I was stunning all the time and I was very unhappy. And like a lot of first year and second year students in college, that's typically when you notice mental health challenges. I was probably depressed and didn't know it because I wasn't satisfied in what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't able to enjoy being a campus student. I didn't do much on campus uh, with campus life until my third year in school. So it was, it was overwhelming. Um, But most importantly, it was revealing 
it revealed to me all of those things. And I'm so grateful for my friend, Melissa, who I speak about in my forthcoming book, Adulting as a Millennial, A Guide to Everything Your Parents Didn't Teach You, because I don't know without her if I would have even known that there was another program, because the sad thing is, for a lot of college students, you don't have advisement. Now, there's advisors, we know, in your in your um, track, but most people don't seek those people out. So I didn't know there was an advisor that I could have spoken to. I didn't speak to one in nursing. Uh, Melissa was the one who pointed me to the advisor who was also the chair of the board that oversaw the program. And it was through my connection to this particular um, woman, this doctor who was really a warrior woman, a great uh, friend she became. I was able to take the classes, enjoy them immensely, and then with her support, matriculate into the program, do my practicum in the summertime, and graduate with my incoming class. Hmm. Talk about just the power of friendship and mentorship and having people in your life that can sort of help you take the blinders off maybe. Mm -hmm. I love what you just shared and your journey has been really incredible. And so I would love to talk a little bit about um, your work today because, I mean, this has been an interesting year. We started off 2020. um, We had the death of Kobe Bryant and his daughter, and then we had COVID-19. And so many of us have been in quarantine now for, I think I'm going on like maybe three and a half months. I don't know about you. And then now we have this moment in our history, which is much needed, very important, personally very happy to see that so many people are really waking up to the realities of the systemic racism in this country and the experiences of black people and what people are experiencing. And so there's so much going on. And I think if people had anxiety before, like even just before you had like a baseline for anxiety and then you went into quarantine and COVID and am I going to get COVID? And then there's all this other anxiety. I mean, I can imagine in your work and what you do, you're seeing you're seeing a lot of people, I don't know if the word is struggling, but maybe having more more of a difficult time. I always like to say they're having an experience. Yes, yes. You know, and we could have multiple experiences at the same time. As a mindfulness practitioner myself, that's a space that I offer to clients to go into. It's a think about where you are in this moment right here and now. Think about how you feel in this moment. Think about what you're looking at, listening to, what are you absorbing? Because sensory overload Mm -hmm. creates panic, creates anxiousness, creates restlessness, sleeplessness, creates difficulty digesting food, concentrating on your work, listening to others, supporting yourself. There's so many things that happen when we're looking at and listening to tragedies, um, faced with corruption, dealing with um, angst, dealing with coercion, with the government telling us what we Mm -hmm. need and have to do, Um, the bullying that's going on, the insensitivity to trauma. Mm. So there's lots of experiences. And what I help people to do is not claim the experience as a characteristic. So it's not saying I'm depressed, I'm anxious. It's saying I'm having an experience with anxiety. I feel anxious. I feel low energy. I am noticing that I'm having a lot of thoughts because that way we don't shame ourselves for noticing what is going on around us, within us, through us. And I think that's very transformative and powerful. And it's empowering clients to notice signs and symptoms that are oftentimes created through our experience with our environment. So that's not your fault. Mm -hmm. So thereby using language in a way that doesn't have you own this as this is some flaw of your personality versus your experience with the environment. I think that's transformative in the way that we think of ourselves and we think of what's going on in our world. I love how you explain this as this is an experience. This is something you're Mm -hmm. um, maybe even bearing witness to, but you don't have to take it on as a characteristic uh, as your own. Mm -hmm. So you're not defined Mm -hmm. um, by what you're going through. And I think so many of us are feeling, are feeling defeated and overwhelmed and depleted and experiencing this level of, of trauma that you 
that you described. So for anyone that's listening that is experiencing that, um, what, what would you say? What's some advice that you can share um, to maybe help them take the first step towards maybe stepping, stepping outside of that? That's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I work on with people with regards to mindfulness is just to slow down and notice. And that's sometimes very challenging for people. Mm -hmm. I know myself, I have to practice this every day, multiple times a day to slow myself down, to notice what I'm doing, how fast I'm moving, what my head feels like when I'm talking about something or talking about something triggering for too long. And I give myself grace. I work at self-compassion. It's something that I mirror for my clients. And through that, it validates their experience. Um, we often look for external validation, but validating ourselves is of utmost importance first. When we do that, when we notice that there's an us, there's a me, there's a you, then we can become more aware um, that sometimes things are not personal that mm -hmm. sometimes things are not about people not caring enough, but that it's we should look for ourselves in the mix of everything that's going on. And with doing so, we notice what's happening. We notice what we're experiencing. We notice what we want to maybe experience uh, next. So even if we're jumping ahead or we're playing stories back in our mind, it's okay to just see that see those thoughts coming in, see those thoughts as they go possibly, or if they multiply, and then just gently taking some time to breathe so that we don't let our minds and our bodies remain charged because that creates inflammation, the fight or flight experience, um, the responses we call it typically mm -hmm. in, in psychology and sociology, but it's an experience too. So what I help people to do is put language to that and also to remind us that it's okay to not necessarily do the automatic thing that we're noticing happens when we feel afraid or worried or intimidated or uncertain, but that it's all right to do something else and something else we could figure out as we go along. Mm -hmm. And have you found that it's, it's sort of unique to every, to everyone? Because for me, I notice when I'm experiencing those feelings of anxiety or distress and um, whatever my go-to response is, um, you know, I found that I need to replace it with something else. So for mm -hmm. me, that might be uh, taking a step back from the computer, which is usually what's giving me the anxiety, mm -hmm. and taking a step back, maybe going on a walk, maybe picking up the phone yeah. and calling a friend. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's literally just getting up, moving to the other side of the room taking a deep breath and coming back. So have you found that with your clients, it, it's about identifying, um, you know, something different for everyone that might work? Or are there some kind of common themes or, or through lines that you can share that, that might be helpful for people? Yes, it's both. So in mindfulness, the something else, I try to allow clients to figure out for themselves, right? Mm. This is the work of freeing people from the constraints of the world, telling them what to do. We are innately smart, we're intuitive. So using our intuition guides us. Sometimes we don't know or notice the intuitiveness of the being because we're dealing with stress, we're dealing with so many stressors at the same time that our body tends to be in overreaction mode. So what I do is just allow quietness to sit with, what are the tendencies you, you like to go to when you notice that there's less joy? What are the things that give you more pleasure? And as we just sit with that and we think and explore, people remember, mm -hmm. you know, they remember like, oh, I, I like walking my dog. I like going for mindful walks through the grass. I like sitting in the park under the tree. I enjoy crossing my legs in lotus position and just closing my eyes and noticing my breath and feeling myself grounded and anchoring into my seat. You know, people notice those things when they get still. Mm -hmm. So I allow that to occur naturally. And then if there's some ways that we can help people who might get stuck, get unstuck, I'll offer up some tools and it might include the things that 
are known to be effective from research, which is we need to move the energy out. Mm -hmm. That's part of why earthing or grounding is so vital because when we feel dysregulated, that energy gets trapped. It literally gets trapped between the tissues in your body, the muscle tissue, it gets trapped in, in your system. So your whole central nervous system may shut down or overreact to the stimuli. And so it's important to get that energy out. So you may need to move your body, which might mean getting up and, and doing some dance moves or getting up and shaking it off or actually going for a walk mindfully without your devices or if people talking to you. So moving your body is very helpful. It's medically based, but it's also mindfully based. And so I help them to find those things for them too that are known to be proven to help, but also to allow them to do the work of exploring for themselves first. Yeah. What you just said reminds me of something that I had written down in my journal maybe about a month ago, which was that energy needs to be moved in order to be healed. And so yeah. you have to you have to move, whether that's moving your physical body or moving your mental body um, mm -hmm. and not staying, you know, in that sort of distressed space, which I'm wondering yeah. then how do boundaries play a role in all of this? Because um, I think what's been so interesting is so we're spending so much time on social media. We're spending mm -hmm. so much time watching the news. And I think it's this interesting balance of wanting to stay informed and wanting to know what's going on and, um, whether that, you know, especially with the virus, like protecting yourself, what's the latest news? What is everyone saying on social media? But then that stimulation factor, it's so, it's so overstimulating. And I think sometimes it can be, um, obviously overwhelming. So what role then do, do boundaries, um, play in all of this? It plays a significant role because like we were speaking of regarding mindfulness, there's the in and out experience mm -hmm. in mindfulness of checking inward and then checking outside of yourself and noticing. And that's something that I incorporate into my work. So what that looks like is like pre COVID, for example, it was often recommended that people monitor their screen time mm -hmm. because it has a negative impact on the brain. It also has a negative impact on your vision over time. I have clients who've reported problems with their vision from being in front of the computer for too long. So we've had to get blue glasses to put on and wear watching our, our screens. Mm -hmm. So before COVID, those things were recommended for people to monitor, limit your time in front of your computer, put an app on your phone to time you when you're reaching a certain limit. A certain limit might mean no more than 30 minutes a day on social media, which is hard for a lot of people because it's so mesmerizing mm -hmm. to be on social media, but also do things that you recognize are beneficial for you and recognize what's not beneficial for you. So I'll ask clients, for example, when they are spending 20 minutes or 30 minutes of their session talking about the news, I'll interject and I'll say to them, is this what you wanted to spend your time talking about? Mm. And most times they don't notice how long they've been talking about one subject matter that gets them really aroused. And when they think about that, just by taking a pause and listening to my question, they'll tune in and notice, oh my gosh, it's very overwhelming to me. I feel like I'm back in the moment where I first saw the news. Mm -hmm. No, I don't want to spend the rest of my session talking about this. Let's change the topic. That's more informed, but that's coming from the self, mm -hmm. just by me prompting through one question to see what comes up. So that helps people, but you need folks who are grounded to help you to do that. Right. So it's important to remember that socializing is what social beings do, although we have to do it at a distance right now. We may also notice that because we spend so much time in front of our TV, our phones, our computers, that after work, you may not want to talk. Um, if you live with people, you may not want to speak mm -hmm. to them every day because you see them all the time at this point. So you may have to just gently notice and then speak up and say, with loving kindness, I want to be able to protect my mental health and I deserve that. And so when someone comes to you wanting to talk or someone sends you messages and they want to engage you, you just say, 
for this time, I have to be with where I am. And for me, that means resting. That means turning away from social media. That means not talking about triggering news. And let's start to accept with our friends and our loved ones that that's okay for them and respect that that's what they need and not push it. Yeah. I think what you just shared is so important because it, I think it really is this balance of being engaged, but then is this really how you want to spend all of your time? And and yeah. we do have that free will, but you have mm-hmm. to sort of be conscious of it to say, okay, I'm going to engage, but only to this extent. And so I think it's mm-hmm. a form of self-care almost um, to to know your limit or mm-hmm. to maybe even you know know your boundaries. And it's interesting because I've had people who have said to me, well, if you're not watching the news, if you're not staying on Twitter, if you're not super engaged, um, then you're just like not processing the tough stuff. Like you're not engaged with it. Um, and and I think that's interesting because I think it can bring about a lot of shame for somebody um, mm-hmm. who may have someone in their life who is saying that to them. Like if you're not plugged in all the time, then you don't care. You're not an advocate. You're not you know socially aware. But what you said so beautifully, I think, contradicts that. And we need that contradiction because mm-hmm. you can engage to your own limit. You can, um, you know, be involved, you know, know what's going on, want to do your part to make change in the world, but you don't have to also let it be all consuming. Um, mm-hmm. So I love what you shared because I think that's so it's so important for so many to hear us, I think, especially right now. Yeah, and I'm glad that you said that, Sydney, because I've been having this conversation in different ways, mm-hmm. and I want to elevate it more. There is this aspect that comes along with various stages and various people who are considered active in their activism and who are activists. Mm-hmm. So wherever people are in their level of awareness is fine. What's not fine is bullying people into doing more than they can handle Mm -hmm. or shaming and humiliating people for not doing quote activism unquote a certain type of way and those of us who continue to work on our consciousness we have to refute that because There are folks with platforms, as we know, on social media and in the news that have lots of followers who will stand by this person simply because they're loyal to that individual, but they won't check their messaging. Mm -hmm. And it's important that if we do this work, there's a level of compassion that comes along with it and that we notice when we're starting to abuse our influence and our power to tell people what to do. Mm -hmm. So we're not in anyone else's skin. That is why working towards empathy is something that's a practice. But we need to be mindful that, you know, things are triggering to people in different ways. So yelling or humiliating or shaming or name calling or blaming people, that only triggers things that may already exist in their past or present life. And that's abusive and it has to be called out. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you said that because it reminds me of something I've seen quite a lot, I think, over at least the last week or so, is that Mm -hmm. there are so many lanes here. Some people are protesting. Some people are uh, posting online. Some people are donating. Some people are having tough conversations with the people in their life. Some people are having those tough conversations at work. And so I think it's been such a nice reminder to see that messaging because you can't physically occupy every lane because you will mm-hmm. you will run out of steam. You will, will be depleted. You will. And I think we're in this for the long haul. So mm-hmm. find for yourself what works, what feels good, what can you can sustain yourself, uh, what actions you can do that are going to be sustaining. Um, but it's it takes a certain I think it takes a certain amount of practice to be able to yeah. do what you just shared, which is so important of saying, I'm not going to let someone else's words or what they're saying to me or what they're projecting change my my feeling of myself in this in this moment um and i think that's sort of like a muscle um that we have to work on but having these conversations and these reminders it's my hope that it'll remind all of us um you know to do that me too me too 
So this brings me to something um, that you mentioned a little bit earlier too, which was about insensitivity with trauma. And I think so many of us deny our experiences with trauma because we don't know that it's trauma. Um, And so I would love it if we could talk a little bit about that, because I think especially now with what is being shared in the news and on social media, um, everything from COVID to George Floyd's death, people are experiencing trauma, I think, in ways that they didn't know existed. Um, so how do, how do you sort of get to this space? And maybe this is too much of a loaded question, but how do you get to this space of no longer denying um, the trauma that you're experiencing? Yeah, where, where can people start? Because I think maybe the veil of that trauma is just now being lifted for so many of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's where that sense of depletion and anxiety and depression comes from. Um, so yeah, where, where can we start with this? It's a powerful question. It's a loaded time that we're living in. So it's apropos to everything that's going on right now. Mm-hmm. And we can start with where individually we are because there's one among many. So I'm one person, but I'm also within several different groups, um, female, black person of color, non, you know, Christian person. So all of these different characterizations I fall into, like so many people do. And there's different messaging around that from those different groups. So respecting individuality is to me always very important because as anyone else would probably say it when you are outside of the group there you are mm-hmm. you know and then it, within the group there you still are so it's important to say for me in this time that um, I can do what I'm capable of doing and I notice that I'm really sad with what's going on in the world and so some days it may be really tough and it may start with you letting it out in a way that's not harmful to yourself nor to anyone else so that may include that you cry or wail I mean my gosh I remember seeing movies when I was a child and reading stories and anthologies when I was in high school of black people wailing, Mm -hmm. you know, in church, in the fields, outside, when they would lose sons and babies and mothers and loved ones and husbands and spouses to violence that was happening as a result of being black in America. And that feeling of wanting to wail and actually wailing is happening again. Mm -hmm. That is one of the most (sighs) exposing forms of grief I've ever seen in my life. And so I'm seeing that in my time right now. My clients are wailing sometimes in their sessions. They are crying, and that's okay, and I hold space for that. Sometimes I give them the words, you know, to say whatever they can't get out to describe what they're feeling and at the same time or at other times I say there may not be any words there may just be a feeling and don't feel compelled to talk if there are any words you have to say and that to me is very restorative because sometimes they sit and notice how sad they feel and that's when the crying begins Mm -hmm. so just being right where a client is, is is so it's such a privileged position for me because I'm honored to do this work and I know it's not easy and it's not something that um, I think you really can read a textbook and learn how to do. So it's innately who I am. It's also a skill I've had to work on too. And we need to continue um, beyond just therapists doing this work, human beings doing this work because it's a part of humanity. So let's also meet people where they are in their humanity. Mm -hmm. Let's remind ourselves, is this the most humane way we can treat what's going on at this time? If we're lashing out, if we're um, violently attacking one another, if we're shaming or humiliating people on on public platforms, right? Like that's going back to the previous question. Um, So doing that is also bringing compassionate care to social justice. And so there's a mindful way to be an activist. And that's where I come in. 
I, so meeting yeah. people in that way, that's why I'm, I'm hoping will help. What you just said, compassionate care to social justice. We need that. And I think more people are understanding that and feeling that, that mm -hmm. this is a time for more compassion and empathy. But in order to reach that space, there needs to be more awareness. And that awareness comes from both, I think, as an individual, but also as a community. And being aware of really what's going on, not turning a blind eye, but being willing to sit, I think, in this space of listening. And within mm -hmm. that space of listening is that space of compassion. And mm -hmm. more people are reaching that space. So I'm grateful for what you shared because being in a, what you shared about your, your clients, expressing this deep emotion and being okay with that, or even if you don't feel okay expressing it, knowing that you are safe in that moment to do so, it has to be transformative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, creating safety, emotional safety for people who have never felt safe. That's what we forget. Mm -hmm. That's what this time is doing to the minds of what we're seeing and hearing is that you've had generations, we've had this whole country, generations, Sydney, of people who've never felt safe. So mm -hmm. if I, you know, had a grandparent that was, or a great, great grandparent that was brought to this country as an enslaved African, and, and four generations later, here I am, I may not still feel safe with my education, with my light skin color, with the texture of my hair, with living in a gentrified community, with speaking a certain way, all of these things that so-called, uh, the, these things that are considered privileged positions yeah. to give me, you know, access to things, conversations like these, for example, that other people will never probably have. And, and I recognize that, and still I may not feel safe. So, to hold space for people to cry, yell, weep, mourn, write, journal, take photographs of, to share, to dialogue, to sit in meditation with people, all of these different holistic care practices that are available and we can access um, with, you know, of course, access to the internet and hopefully for those who don't have it, being able to do it in public spaces like the park or in their church or some place in their home. Those things that can be done right now are giving people permission for the first time maybe in their lineage, not just now, their lineage to say, you can be right where you are and I'm gonna witness it with you so that you don't do this by yourself and you know that you'll be okay. I'll, I'll hold you in that way. And I think that's very spiritual and I think that's sacred work and, and it should be treated as such. I'm really grateful for what you just said and I think this is so important for for everyone to hear that what we are bearing witness to, I think in, in such a beautiful and powerful way, but it's also bringing up, I think a lot of powerful emotions and others bearing witness to someone else's emotion. Um, mm -hmm. Where are we, are we are really seeing, like you shared, being reflected back at us, people who have never felt safe, who have mm -hmm. lived with this anxiety and this fear. Um, and it's deep, deeply rooted. Um, and, I'm sort, I'm sort of speechless because I, he I hear exactly what you're saying and it makes so much sense to me. And that's why I really believe it's so important to have a conversation like the one we're having so that we can even bring those words to light and to the table, so to speak, mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. people really, really know that and really hear that. Um, and it's, it's, it just feels more important than ever to give to give ourselves, to give one another, to give the black community, people of color, that opportunity to really express that anger, that sadness, that fear, that anxiety, that they, that feeling that you just express that not feeling safe, mm -hmm. um, in, in your own skin or in your own existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very sad, isn't it? Yeah. It, it yeah. really, it really is. And, and, um, I I talked about this in an episode I released maybe two weeks ago. Um, I'm, I'm white. I'm very aware of my own privilege. Uh, mm -hmm. And for me, when I started the podcast, I have 
wanted from day one to really provide a space to share more stories and share more voices and and use what I could maybe create to help do that. And uh, mm-hmm. my own passion and my own mission to do that has actually never been stronger. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm really grateful that we've had this this conversation because I know that I have so much more to learn. Um, I just want to open up a space to have this kind of dialogue. Yeah. Um, so I'm so, I'm so grateful for what you shared because I know that this is deeply personal for you too. Mm -hmm. It is. Thank you so much for that, Sydney. I appreciate it. I can imagine because you're, you're of service, but you're also Mm -hmm. experiencing what you're helping others transform for themselves. Um, my mom is a marriage and family therapist. Um, and so I know that not that she shares anything with me and cause she's, She's good at what she does. She knows her boundaries. But yeah. I can see sometimes, you know, on her face after having a tough session um, with a client. And so I can imagine for you, it's sort of this duality of processing. You hold the space yeah. for your client, but this is also so personal for you. It is. It's something that in my work we call counter transference. Mm-hmm. It's the experience of watching and witnessing something that is going on in the room with a client and having a remembering of what I have also experienced, right? It's, it's, it's going on on a continuum. So me remembering something that I have witnessed, watched, heard, read about, been told, you know, from my ancestors, my predecessors, it's, um, it's ongoing. So as I'm there with my clients, I'm there with myself and I'm there with my past and it's all in the room together. Yeah. That's the counter-transferential experience of being a therapist. It goes on beyond race and gender and class, but at this time, especially, it's going on with what's happening in the world as a woman of color, a black woman, a woman of a particular ethnic group. Mm-hmm. It's something that I'm feeling and um, it's, it's challenging, but you know what, Sydney, at the same time, I went through a really difficult time several years ago and it lasted for several years. Mm-hmm. I was dealing with a lot of personal things, taking care of family members while also growing my practice. And I was thriving at the same time. It was a really uh, ironic kind of situation to be in, but it was beautiful. And I didn't know exactly what would come of it when I reached the other side of sorrow, stress, uh, loneliness, etc. But I believed, and this is where my coaching work on the other end comes in and my mindfulness and spiritual work comes in, I believed something greater would happen on the other side of the stress. Mm -hmm. So I stayed very faithful in doing the work that I was doing on myself. And that's when I became a mindfulness practitioner, actually. And I remain steadfast in reaching out to people and talking about my stress, talking about my angst, and that helped tremendously. And I was also in therapy myself. And when I did get through the trials, I was relieved, of course, but I was also really grateful because my spiritual practices and and, and my higher power carried me through without falling apart. Mm -hmm. And that's something I share because I know innately as a black woman that black people feel if they start crying, they're going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. They feel that they're never going to stop crying or they're never going to recover from the sadness or that they may not be able to get up and work or take care of their families or laugh again or have joy. And so I share with them sometimes my experiences so that they can see that you will get up again, you will recover, you will find joy, you will be restored. Um, It's that you can do one while also doing many other Mm -hmm. things. And so I'm in a great place in my life. I knew that this time would occur for me to be available to something more than what I was experiencing in the past, didn't know what, Mm -hmm. but that is why today when I'm asked how I'm doing, I can honestly say I'm well. Mm. 
and I can still cry in the midst of what's going on and write about it and talk with people like you about it, thankfully, and I can laugh and I can enjoy my loved ones and I can turn away from things and I can produce things like my new book that's coming out and yeah. I can do all of these beautiful, wondrous things and my business is thriving in the midst of this because mm -hmm. I believe there would be better and when better came, it included mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, as well as financially. And so now I'm in a space where I can hold so much space for people because I feel well and I feel good and I feel happy and I feel sadness too while this is going on and I don't feel completely attached to every experience that everyone else is having too because if I were I would not be able to be of use thank you so much for what you just said because it beautiful and um I wish you could see me because I've just been just like in awe of what you just shared mm -hmm. what you said struck me of you can have joy at the same time as these difficult experiences and I think that's such a beautiful reminder um, that joy is not exclusive. You can still celebrate. You can still find moments. You can still um, jump up and down and like have, you know, that exciting mm -hmm. feeling in your bones. Right. Um, so right. I'm, I'm grateful you said that. And so I have to ask, what are some things right now that are bringing you joy um, that you're, you know, you're either experiencing or, or doing? Yeah. What, what's bringing mm -hmm. you joy right now? Thank you. One, I practice what I preach. I sit in the sun. Mm -hmm. So I have this beautiful bench that sits in front of a really awesome view <laughs> um, in my living room that, that faces the sun and has beautiful trees. So every day I get up and I open my curtains. I raise mm -hmm. my blinds um, in between sessions. I sit on that bench and I sit in the sun and I get vitamin D and that's like feeling love from mother earth because it's warm. It makes me happy. It relaxes me too. Um, so I do things like that. I make sure that the windows are open in my house throughout the entire house so that every room is nurtured by the sun. Mm -hmm. um, so it brings in that joyful experience, that warmth, that sunshine and happy feeling that I love about spring and summer. Um, I also listen to ocean sounds on YouTube that really grounds me. So when I feel charged from one session or many sessions where clients are, are very reactive, I'll put my headphones on and I will tune in to ocean breezes and that just calms me and centers me. And then because I'm also dating a beautiful black man, I want to make sure he's safe. And mm -hmm. so he and I, if we can't talk because we're both very busy in our work, we will, we have an agreement that before midnight, we must check in. So we will text each other if we can't get on the phone or if we can't, you know, do IG live to check in. Um, but we will definitely make sure we touch base with each other and just say, you know, how are you? You know, are you, are you drinking water? Are you taking care of yourself? Are you saying no when you need to say no? Yeah. And sometimes that's just sufficient. And then lastly, and most importantly, I don't work every day because mm -hmm. working every day in this kind of work that I do is very exhausting. If I don't take time away from it, I don't feel well to come back to it. So I, you know, ensure my privacy. I don't put my private, my private life on social media. Um, I ensure my mental space. So I do not allow people to expect a response from me when I'm off from work, unless it's a crisis, of course, with a client. Yeah. So I take time away from emails and work and social media and all of that when I can, not as much lately, but when I can, I do that every week from Thursday through Saturday. And I just, take it down a couple notches and I try to get more rest and then I laugh and I spend time with my lover and we have a great time together just like chilling watching movies and talking or not talking and snuggling and having affection because human touch is really important during this time too if yeah. we can get it from people that we know are safe from the quarantine yeah what talk about just a beautiful balance of being yeah. out there engaging but then also taking those moments of respite um, and connection for yourself. Before we go, I, I have to ask you the question that I ask everybody that comes on the podcast. And that is, what is your biggest dream? I have never been asked that question. Thank you <laughs> for this. My biggest dream for myself 
is to live an extraordinary life, and I'm already on that path. Mm, you are. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm grateful to the yeah. most high for that. Um, my dream for the world is for there to be much more patience, kindness, and execution of compassion on a regular and consistent basis. With that, we'll love more, we'll treat people with more kindness and respect that they deserve, we'll respect difference and sameness at the same time, and we'll be able to enjoy life because we won't be at odds with whatever we can't tolerate. Mm. That's beautiful. I love that. We're on our way too, I think. Um... Not immediately, but we'll get there. We'll get to that greater space of compassion and kindness and empathy and understanding. And and thank you so much for such a honestly powerful conversation. This is the best way to start off my morning. And so I'm so, I'm grateful for what you shared, um, your vulnerability, both within your own life, but also just the advice that you and the wisdom that you shared. I think so many people are going to Listen to this more than once and take notes. Um, So thank you so much, Asha. Where can everybody find you, connect, learn more, and pre-order your new book, um, Adulting as a Millennial? Yeah, thank you. The fastest way is go to Instagram. I'm at Asha Tari Mental, and that's spelled A-S-H-A, T like Tom. A-R-R-Y Mental, M-E-N-T-A-L. So Asha Tari Mental on Instagram, Asha Tari on Twitter. And go to my website, lifecoachasha.com, where Adulting as a Millennial, a guide to everything your parents didn't teach you, is available for pre-order. You could join my blog there. I give some really helpful coaching tips to living a life on purpose by design. It comes out weekly. People can book me there. And also we have some amazing products there that are going to help people People during this time, which is our new compassion journal and a free downloadable worksheet on compassion and self-compassion particularly. So I think there's a lot to offer and I hope people do get a lot from the show. You're doing incredible work, Sydney. Yeah. It was a pleasure, deep pleasure to sit in this time with you and talk because I didn't know I would feel all of this. Oh, well, I'm so grateful and, and the feeling is so mutual. Everything is going to go in the show notes. It's going to be so easy for everybody to find you. And I'm so I'm so excited that we've connected. You're just doing such great work to help people, I think, transform where they are right now, step really into who they are, um, and have that courage to feel those deep emotions. Um, and what we're really searching for right now. So thank you so much again. Thank you.